Good afternoon. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Luigi Zingales. I'm the faculty director of the Stiegler Center here. And we're very happy today to host Luis Garicano, a former colleague, who is going to give a three-day mini course on organi organizing uh, technological change. So first of all, uh, uh, thanks Luis for coming. Uh, before we introduce properly Luis, let me tell you a few administrative things. The first one is we are recording live streaming, so silence your phones, and when at the end you ask question, wait for the microphone so, so that uh, also your question can be recorded. Second, uh, I want to share with you some of the other initiatives that the Stiegler Center is, is running. Uh, in particular, you want to sort of uh, look at the, the website, but there is one I would like to highlight on November 12th. We are going to host a conversation with a prominent short seller, um, Fanny Quadir, a young woman who manages a only, uh, their own short only hedge fund and made a name uh, for herself uh, in a shorting Valiant Pharma stock uh, in a very controversial action. In fact, uh, if you want to go know more about her, I strongly advise there is a, on Netflix a series called Dirty Money, and there is an episode on the pharmaceutical industry, and she's in that episode. So if you want to come prepare for that event, watch, uh, watch the Netflix series. By the way, the entire series is great, except uh, the one of the maple syrup that is not that great. But anyway, um, back to the topic of today. Uh, so um, first of all, uh, is very important in the modern economy how we organize uh, uh, the production and in particular how this sort of uh, impact uh, the working of the economy and uh, Luis Garicano who is a PhD from Chicago and was a colleague here at uh, Booth for many years is really an expert on this. Uh, now he is a professor of economics and strategy and the head of the Center for the Digital Economy at the IE Business School in Madrid. And uh, in between there and here has been also a professor at LSC. Uh, also, he has been recently elected vice president of ALDE, which is the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe, and is basically uh, the economic mind behind a party in Spain called Ciudadanos. And uh, before I uh, invite all uh, to welcome you. I want to tell you a little story that uh, uh, economists are not particularly good at becoming politicians. There is only one exception, which is actually a very important one. It comes from Chicago. Uh, you probably all have studied the Cobb Douglas production function. Paul Douglas was a professor of Chicago, became a senator from Illinois, and for many years was a senator. Uh, in Washington, representing Illinois, and then when he finished his uh, job as a senator, he came back and we started publishing in the Journal uh, of, of uh, Political Economy. So uh, my wish is not only that uh, he, uh, Louis, was going to be so famous as, uh, as Paul Douglas in every dimension, but also that finished his political career, he will come back and publish again in JP. So help me welcome uh, Louis Garicano. Uh, it's it's a really an amazing amazing pleasure to be here. Uh, I spent uh, 15 years uh, of my life in Hyde Park, so uh, I, I I'm I'm really really delighted uh, in the university in the economics department first, and then and then uh, here at Booth. So um, <clears throat> it's great to see you all. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I wanted to talk about uh, how organization helps us to understand. Uh, some of the main issues that are happening right now and changes in the in the cost of organizing people and the basic facts that I want to put on the table are the following facts there's been a very large change in the wage distribution which is uh, people have called it wage polarization uh, basically the hollowing up the middle class has been losing space as you will see there has been a drop in a, a, a huge raise in top managerial wages. There's been changes in the occupational distribution. There's been changes in market concentration. Markets are getting more and more concentrated and the labor share of income has been dropping. All of those things have a lot to do with what's happening politically. A lot of us think that uh, it would be hard to explain populism without understanding these facts. But they also respond to a 
similar type of changes as you will see, and I, I think technological changes, and I hope to be able to, to convince you of that. What I will do is I will first go over a set of theories that aim to explain some of these things. I will suggest that those theories don't really account for these stylized facts, and then I will put a theory on the table which has to do with the drop in communication costs. So report the stylized facts, try to give you some, uh, some, like, some very, very uh, fast overview of some alternative theories and give you the theory that I think uh, makes most sense. So what are the stylized facts? The first fact is wage polarization. Uh, in the past, when we talked about inequality, we tended to think about things getting worse for the bottom and, and better for the top in a monotonic way. The more, the higher up you are, the better off you are. Uh, that's not what has happened. Um, let me actually show you here. Um, this, this graph uh, shows you the monotonic change that we have had in the past, not now. Meaning, the lower in the distribution of earnings you are, these are the people who earn the lowest wages, these are the people who earn the highest wages, the lower, the more to the left you are, the more you suffer. And the, and the more to the right you are, the, more, the better off you are. That's not what has been happening in the, in the last uh, two decades since, let's say, 1990 or so. Um, in the last two decades, what has happened is the people at the bottom have basically remained still, and the, the, the wage inequality has grown only at the top. The second stylized fact, and you're very aware of that, is the race in CEO pay and other superstars. Uh, this is from a paper from 2008, but the, the facts are, are, are pretty clear uh, in, in any other paper. The compensation of CEOs, whatever way you m measure it, including stock options, including salaries, has been raising very substantially. Notice this is a log scale, so it's a very, very large increase. Um, now, the income share of the top 1%, similarly, and, and you're all aware of this fact, this is the Piketty and size uh, research, but it, whatever way you see it, you will see a very, very large increase in the take of the top 1%. They took something like 8% of all income, and they're taking something close to 20% of all income. Third stylized fact, and this is uh, maybe the crucial aspect for the increasing anxiety of the middle classes, is the uh, drop in jobs in the middle. Uh, this is the same idea as before. We're going to place people by their first, second, third, fifth, hundredth percentile in the uh, wage distribution. So this is the person who has the highest wage, and this is the person who has the lowest wage. And we're going to see what happens to each one of them over this period, uh, 1980 to 2005. And what you see, and, and the similar thing happens if you continue the data for another decade, is that these jobs haven't dropped. In fact, they have increased. There is more, uh, there's wage growth for those. There is uh, not, not wage, but employment growth. There is employment growth here, and there's a lot of jobs lost in this middle, okay? And we'll try to make sense of that. Uh, this also happens in Europe. This graph is really striking because it's really the same in every country. The top top 30%, middle 30%, bottom 30% of jobs, and you see that the bottom 30% and the top 30% of jobs increase, and the middle 30% in every European country drops. Um, fourth stylized fact. Now, this is a 2017 paper. This is probably the biggest uh, stream of research in economics right now. Every single person is doing, the profession is doing research on, on this issue uh, since this 2017. There was something before from the OCD a year earlier, but really this is now a big, big deal in the economics profession. The fact that uh, markets are getting increasingly concentrated. The market share of the largest firms is growing. Anecdotally, you all have in mind the uh, GAFA or FAGA plus, plus Netflix, etc. Uh, you know, Google and Facebook dominate 95% of online advertising, but we have Amazon, we have Apple, companies that dominate very much, uh, a lot of increasing market share in their industries, uh, and that not only grow vertically, but also grow horizontally. The scope of these companies is, is, is dramatically increasing. They are doing more and more things from retail to energy, etc. This is from a presentation uh, by uh, uh, Fabio Well, if you actually look at the data, 
and not just at those, the anecdotes on those four firms, what you see is that the same fact is happening uh, throughout essentially the entire distribution of industries. If you look at concentration as measured by the concentration ratio, which is the market share of the largest four firms, or you look at concentration as measured by CR20, the market share of the largest 20 firms, what you will see is that those numbers are growing in essentially every sector. Uh, finance, uh, look at the numbers, they are pretty, pretty striking. Here we have, in the left, we have the four concentration, in the right, we have the 20. Uh, if you look at something like finance, you, you hear starting from like 25, going all the way to 35. Uh, if you look at the top 20, you're going 20 points up. If you look at, sorry, my, my shoe is untied, I apologize. <laughs> if you look at, um, if you look at manufacturing, the same thing happens. If you look at the service sector, um, even larger in terms of actual uh, magnitude, CR4 with sales is going uh, 10, 16, CR4, 20 is going, well, four points here. If you look at utilities and transportation, same fact. If you look at retail trade, wholesale trade, same fact. So fourth stylized fact uh, is an increase in concentration that seems to be happening in every industry. Fifth stylized fact, and again, if you want to think about middle class anxiety, a really important stylized fact is a drop in the labor share of income, more or less in all economies. Uh, Paul Douglas, who is somebody who I have very much admired, I, uh, there is a, bi a biography of him in the Regenstein Library. And he actually, where's Luigi? Luigi. Uh, there's actually a story that Adlai Stevenson and him were discussing who would run for president. And I, I, he was too nice when Adlai Stevenson wanted to run, he withdrew. But actually, he had actually a chance of, of being president of the US uh, uh, in that, uh, in the, in that uh, election against Eisenhower. So, um, he made his name on that function with the labor, where the labor share of income is constant. For he had noticed that in old data, he was just writing on little pieces of paper and actually finding that it was always the same. He was surprised. And then he developed this production function that has been the workhorse of all economics. Well, it turns out that when you look at those numbers recently, whether you look in France, in Japan, in the United States, there is quite a bit of evidence that the labor share of income has been dropping. So, how, uh, and that, that's probably correlated with concentration. Uh, this paper that I'm citing here, it's a 2017 paper by Van Rienen, Dorn, David Autor, a group of five, Larry Katz, a group of five very good economists, argues that uh, pretty persuasively. That the places where concentration is increasing, where firms have more market power, I will argue that's not the case, but anyway, where they have more market power, those are the places where workers are actually losing larger labor shares. Um, how can we account for all these facts? So uh, the name of the game is going to be, when we look at, when we try to think of what's going on in the world, what kind of phenomenon, what kind of theory can we actually see that seems to us to rationalize those facts? And of course, I'm going to stack the data to put all the theories, all the other theories uh, to look back. But no, I'm going to show you what people are thinking. I'm going to try to show you what, what I think. First, China, okay, um, there has been increasing concern uh, and not unrelated to the victory of, of Donald Trump, but in the economics profession, we were looking at it for already maybe 10 years, at the race of China, when you get an enormous economy that comes into the uh, uh, world economy, there is a lot of disruption, a lot of jobs change, and a lot of things happening. And so, is the China shock responsible for these things? I would argue that China shock does some work in explaining inequality, but it doesn't do much, and it doesn't do any of the rest. Um, so I'm going to give you a few facts about the China shock. These are from the World Economic Outlook of this year, the 2018 World Economic Outlook. So just look at the blue line. And the interesting thing about the blue line, that's, that's it's a stable, and that's the share of jobs worldwide that are in manufacturing. What the blue line tells you is that, no, there hasn't been 
loss of manufacturing jobs worldwide in manufacturing. Okay, the, the share of jobs worldwide in manufacturing is 14% throughout all of this period. Pretty nice, stable number. However, our intuition that manufacturing is, is being lost in developing countries, in developed countries, is correct. Um, the share of jobs that were in manufacturing in developing countries has gone from 24 to um, 14, or maybe 13, uh, in advanced economies. Has it gone to developing countries? Well, it hasn't, these jobs haven't gone, okay? I'm, I'm being a bit loose there, but they haven't increased in developing countries. If you look at emerging countries in general, there hasn't been an increase, okay? They are at the same place. The jobs have gone to China, okay? Between commas, okay? Between commas. But the place where the manufacturing employment has grown, it's almost a mirror image of that number, is according to World Economic Outlook, according to the IMF, is China, where it has gone from 11% to over 20%, almost a mirror image of what has happened in the West. So if you want to explain Trump, maybe that's the explanation. Now, so then maybe it's over. Then maybe what's happening is we're having a China shock, and that's disrupting all these economies. I mean, first of all, it's not going to account for changes in concentration, etc. but it doesn't even account very well for changes in inequality. If you do the exercise of actually partitioning the change in inequality between inequality in the sectors, between those manufacturing and service sectors, and the inequality that is explained by manufacturing races in China and people have to move to service jobs, what you actually find is that the race of China doesn't do that much for you. In fact, what happens is mostly inequality has increased within service and within industry. Uh, Hanan Hellman, who is a top uh, trade economist in the world, uh, he says, uh, when he looks at it, he says uh, in a survey he has in 2016, that yes, uh, trade has played a role in wage inequality, but its cumulative effect has been modest, and globalization does not explain the preponderance of the rise in wage inequality. So even inequality, which is the first thing we are looking at, doesn't seem to really respond to the trade shock. The second story is the traditional technological shock. Maybe technology has been changing forever. We've had agriculture. We've had that has gone that employed lots of people and now doesn't employ lots of people. Maybe the same that happened with agriculture and the same that happened with textiles has been happening to all these other uh, industries, and that's what's going on. Now, that story is a story from Jan Timbergen, and I'm going to try to explain it in one minute to see if I can. Uh, it's, it's a story that. If you take Kevin Murphy's uh, class, he will, he will explain in, in much better detail. But let me just explain it in a minute. The idea is the following. Inequality in this story is simply the wage premium is simply the price of high skill. If we have a lot of demand for high skill and uh, universities are not producing a lot of high skill labor, then the premium goes up. That means if technology is raising and asking for people with skill, and universities don't keep up, then you will see the premium go up. And if labor supply of high-skilled people is increasing, for example, because universities are, there's a, uh, for example, after the Second World War, there's a lot of people who go on this, uh, on the universities, on those college plans that the U.S. government was 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 providing, uh, the Jobs Act. What's the name of this? The, the college kit, the, G, yeah, GI Bill. With GI Bill, then you have the opposite. You have a lot of supply and not a lot of demand, so then the wage premium drops. That's the idea. Now, that kind of story is not going to work here. Because, as I told you, that kind of story would require that things look like here, right? That as technology advances, then we have more demand for the high skill and, than, than the economy is supplying, and so the premium increases throughout the distribution, more or less. And as I told you, that's true in the past, but that's not true in the, in the more recent period. What we have seen in the more recent period is that inequality really is raising at the top. Now, there's another technological story when you think a little bit more carefully, which is a very pretty story and affects all of your lives and the way you think about your future, which has to do with automatization and robotization. We know there's been a massive increase in information technology. I have here just one of the many ways that you can see Moore's law. Remember, you all. MBA students are smart people and some of your professors and so on, so I don't need to say much. But the key thing here, of course, is that this is a logarithmic scale. What a logarithmic scale like this means is that 
24 months, which is what it takes to double the uh, speed of, of the transistor count or the speed of these technologies, etc., things are going to change as much, technology is going to advance as much in the next 24 months as in the whole history up to today. Okay, that's a very sharp change, and that could explain a lot of what we observe. And I, I will agree and I will argue that yes, it does explain quite a bit, okay? So basically, the story that economists have been telling and that has been explored and that m makes quite a bit of sense is that as technology is changing very rapidly, what you're seeing is automatization, a lot of jobs being lost, and a lot of those jobs in the middle are being lost, okay? So let me tell you briefly this new story, this new version of technological change that is not just simply this, this story about the race between skill and technology, but that is a story that has a, a different, something interestingly different. And the story, what is interestingly different about this story is, this technology story, is the idea of routine task. A routine task is a task that you can write an algorithm to perform. It's a task that could be manual or could be intellectual, but it's a task that you can go over it and describe what you need to do in order to perform it, okay? So you are working in a bank, you're picking this column, adding up to this other column, and producing a number. Or you're picking these pieces of paper, filling them up, uh, putting them in another pile, filling them up, adding something else, and putting it in the next pile. Those are stories that, that speak to, th those, are, those are tasks, sorry, ap apologies, those are tasks that have in common that you can actually write a program that says, pick up this piece of paper, pick up this number, add it up, oops, done. Those are routine tasks. And what is interesting about those tasks is they're not necessarily dumb tasks, okay? They're not necessarily the stuff that anybody can do. In fact, some of those tasks are difficult. I mean, if you are the person who is working before Excel as a bookkeeper, you're the person who's copying all the numbers and taking care of, uh, of, of, of the, the, all of that is precisely copied. You are somebody who knows numbers, who knows how to add up, who is careful, etc. Those are some skills. Uh, those tasks went away. Okay, there were a million jobs lost in bookkeeping, um, which, by the way, just as a footnote, doesn't mean that Excel destroyed jobs because there were more than two million jobs created as financial analysts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there are that even that case is not job, job destruction, but it does illustrate to you what automatization is going to do. It's going to remove tasks that are, in many cases, in the middle, middle class tasks. People who are in the manufacturing uh, industry, people who are in the insurance, in the banking sector. But even if you think about the doctor who is a radiologist or a skin doctor, most of what they're doing is looking at images and classifying them. A good artificial intelligence algorithm can get rid of that or a lot of that task by just, you know, you train the algorithm with uh, deep learning to recognize those tumors and it's going to be better than the doctor. In fact, dermatologists already have been beaten by an AI from uh, AlphaGo from, 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 from Google. So this story says, oh, information, information communication technology is going to, in, where, where does this bite? Well, for a hairdresser, for a person who does your tattoo, or for a person who does your nails, or for the security guard, all, the, all, the, all that story doesn't affect them. Those tasks are not going to be automated because they are service tasks, they involve a direct contact, somebody has to be talking to you while they're doing your hair or whatever. Those are left alone. You go to a kitchen, the cook is cutting the onion in the exact same way he was cutting the onion 100 years ago, okay? So those, let's say, low-end service tasks are untouched. The high-end tasks with this, be careful of what's routine and what's not routine, but the high-end tasks get actually increased productivity from using all this no information technology and people are gonna be able to do more. And in the middle, we're gonna see this hole. We're gonna see a reduction in demand for middle-class jobs, people who are doing tasks that are now getting automated. So this accounts for quite a few, for a few of the facts that we, that we uh, explained. Um, this is a graph that Esteban Rossi Hansberg immediately in a paper that I'm going to discuss uh, briefly later, but any, many, many economists have done graphs like this. 
you can see black and blue tasks are going to be the non-routine high-end tasks, people who benefit from more of this technology, managers, professionals, etc., and you see an increase. Red tasks are going to be these routine types of jobs, office and admin, blue co white collar, production, operators, la laborers, and green tasks are going to, so those do badly, and green tasks are going to be those service tasks that are hard to automate, personal care, food and cleaning, prospect, protective service that actually are doing pretty well if you look at them. So that explains some, I mean, explains nicely the polarization, explains nicely the loss of jobs in the middle. It has nothing to say about whether firm size and market concentrations increase, where labor share of income has increased, or any of those things. So I would say this is a good story. I mean, I think it's a story that you need to keep in account when you go to the job market. Okay, am I going to be doing a routine task or a task that's going to be routine uh, down the road pretty fast? Uh, things that are routine change over time pretty fast. I mean, uh, driving seemed totally not routine, and now it seems, so, seems like it's going to be routine. But it's not a story that I think accounts for all these facts in a parsimonious way. So I, wanted to, I want to give you a fourth explanation. I want to, 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 uh, to develop it a little bit, and then I'm going to um, extract some consequences to, for all these five status facts. So the story here is about the drop in communication technology. And communication technology, what it does is it allows, I mean, the real scarce factor, let me just back up one second, the real scarce factor in the world is the human mind, okay? That is basically, uh, we all have limited time, there's a lot to do, and knowledge is in each person's mind. Somebody probably knows the solution to every problem that we have, but you have to match that person with that problem, and that's very hard, they don't have the time, and they, you don't have the ability to know who knows what. So what you want is you want to uh, apply that knowledge to the right problem, and communication technology is going to allow the knowledge of the best people and the skill of the best people and the talent of the best people to be applied to a wider range of problems. Um, so the idea is going to be that cheaper communication is going to allow you to leverage your talent fast more, and that's going to account for firm size changes, wage changes, occupation changes, and all the rest. Uh, this idea that I'm going to give you, to me, is one of the most interesting ideas in economics. Uh, and, and I'm going to try to spend a couple of slides just telling you the antecedents and where it comes from and what it is. Um, so uh, an economist called Thomas Meyer in a Review of Economic Statistics piece was asking this question. Why is the distribution of earnings so skewed if most things in the world are normal, normally distributed? The skill that we have, the, I mean, the things that we observe, the IQs, the heights, the weights, everything is kind of normally distributed. So we should expect that the underlying things that we can't observe are also normally distributed. And yet, so yes, there will be some people who are pretty out there, there will be some people who are pretty down there, but on, most people are in the middle, and yet the distribution of income is nothing like that. The distribution of income has a huge tail. There's people earning lots and lots and lots and lots and lots more. Why would the reward be so much more extreme than the underlying talent? And his story, which is a beautiful story, uh, and which is crucial to what I wanted to say here uh, in the next 20 minutes or so, and I'm going to let, leave time for you guys to, to ask questions and so um, is called the scale of operations effect. And basically the idea is, in the market, you marry resources with talent. You assign more resources to the more talented. It's not like, yes, the best opera singer is just maybe 1% better than the median opera, or than the opera singer who is more or less normal, so, uh, sorry, average, or 2% or 3%, not much, 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 much better opera singer. But the best opera singer gets assigned to the largest opera houses. He records or she records records. She goes on videos or movies, etc. So the marginal increase in talent gets multiplied by all these resources you command. As you get smarter, as you get more talented in any profession, your reward increases because of your talent, because your talent increases, but also because the resources you command increase. So he talks about for example, a lawyer, right? He talks about opera house, which is a nice example of concert pianist. He talks about a lawyer. 
the better lawyer is not just, okay, you're 10% better lawyer, so you're 10% more. No, because the people with a really difficult case are going to find that better lawyer and pay him for a much harder, much more, much larger case. So the 10% is going to be on a much larger case, and he's going to get more cases. And also, and that will come in a second, he's going to actually have a ton of lawyers who work for him. Okay? So the market is going to give you the scale of operation that multiplies your result. And the idea is going to be very simple at the basic level, which is as communication costs drop, those scales of operations are going to explode, and you're going to have these superstars. Okay? Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the analysis uh, of, of, of applied to, to firm sizes and so on was started by Lucas, who uses the idea of man, which is, okay, what is, why do we serve big firms and small firms? Uh, Bob Lucas, who's a Chicago economist, uh, following this observation, says, look, what you observe of the firm distribution in the economy is simply a distribution of talent, and you are assigning more resources to the more talented people. So you're going to see, uh, depending on the distribution of talent, depending on the technology that allows you to leverage that, that talent, bigger or, or, or smaller firms. Um, there were two papers of Sharon Rosen, who was my advisor, who died very prematurely, who for sure would have had one of those Chicago Nobel Prizes. Uh, and he wrote two papers which are essential on this. One's called Economics of Superstars, where it's about the, the first observation, the, the observation I was telling you before, uh, the mayor observation, which basically says, look, as you increase with communication cost the size of the market for the opera singer or for the football player or for whomever it is, obviously you're going to have the slope, the inequality, the slope of the wage distribution go up. That person is going to be able to have a much higher pay relative to the next person than in the old economy. If you had Cristiano Ronaldo working in Real Madrid in the 1950s, and sorry for the soccer example, but many of you know what soccer is, I hope. Uh, it's not football here. Um, so Ronaldo, Real Madrid in 1956, when he won the Champions League, had 50,000 people in the stadium. My team, Real Valladolid, from a small city in the middle of Spain, would have 17,000 people in the stadium. Today, there's still 17,000 people watching my team. And the final of the Champions League was watched by 500 million people. But that's the scale of operations. If you're Real Madrid and you're paying the salary of a player, and the marginal value of that player is getting you one more stage in a tournament that's worth hundreds and millions of, of, of euros, then, of course, that salary is going to go up relative to the Real Valladolid star by a lot. And that's what Rosen says here. And Rosen here says, and also expanding on Lucas' on Lucas's observation, that's also going to happen with hierarchies. They are going to become um, larger, and it's going to allow people to leverage more of the talent. Um, now, I worked on this... Uh, with Stefan Rossi Hansberg on some of the pieces I'm going to show you and on, and on my uh, Journal of Political Economy paper in 2000. So let me just give you a simple overview of three slides of what's the idea of the theory and what do I think is happening in the world, and then we go back to the status facts uh, that, that we want to explain. So as I was telling you, the starting point is to realize that knowledge is the indispensable input in production. There is money for everybody. There is capital for everybody. I mean, if you have a good idea, you're going to find capital, right? What is scarce is who are the people who can solve problems, who are the people who have this uh, level of talent that can do something with the resources. And the organizational problem arises because we are all limited. I mean, yes, should it be great to have Steve Jobs or to have had Steve Jobs run all the firms in the world? Yeah, he seemed to be much better at coming up with ideas and with good products than anybody else. But it's good, it's, it's busy enough, he was busy enough running Apple to also decide what kind of cars we're gonna drive and to also make suggestions on what kind of other things we're gonna do or purchase. So that's the limited time and he needs a team to leverage that talent. And the way to, lever to relax this time constraint is obviously to work in teams. So the basic idea is to relax the time constraint, what you do is, you have vertical specialization, vertical division of labor. You have Steve Jobs have people below, and those people below have people below, and Steve Jobs is focusing on those things that only he can deal with. He's focusing on the product design, etc. Every other decision is staying below. That allows him, that allows him to leverage his knowledge 
He does the stuff that only he can do, and everybody else is working on more routine problems. So basically, the vertical specialization says, I'm going to have the more routine tasks below in the production and deal with exceptions as I go up the hierarchy. And that way, I'm going to use the best possible way Steve Jobs. I don't want him to be doing the accounting. I can have anybody doing the accounting. I don't want him to be doing the implementation of product design. I can have other guys. That I want him deciding on that key decision, solving these problems that only he can solve. Um, uh, Alfred Sloan had a quote that was the one that motivated all of this work uh, that he says, we, he said, we do not, Alfred Sloan is the founder of General Motors and the father of management. He used to say, we do not do much routine work with the details. They never get up to us. We work hard, but it's on the exceptions. The stuff that is normal gets solved down the hierarchy. And the stuff that is exceptional is what goes up. Now, the key determinant of this team technology is communication. If I can communicate lots, then I don't have such a constraint. If everybody comes into my office and I have to spend an hour with them, then I have a very narrow span and I cannot use my knowledge on so many people. So essentially, as I was saying, the hierarchy allows you to do this vertical specialization and allows the higher levels to help to solve the problems that the lower levels of the hierarchy couldn't solve. In a way, the hierarchy, I mean, the way I would like you to conceptualize the firm is the firm is, is that capability, is that stock of knowledge, is what all of these people know. And you're organizing them to, to get that knowledge used in the best possible way so that the knowledge on the top is used only when necessary and everything else is solved below. Now, so then the problem of the organization is to determine who knows what, who do they communicate with, how many workers of each type are required to minimize the cost of producing a certain output. So let me show you just the hierarchy. Here's the manager. Here was Steve Jobs. He was solving some problems for all these guys. We have two numbers that are important, which is how many direct reports or non-direct reports he has, and which tasks does he do, and which tasks do these other people do, which is the worker autonomy. In this case, the workers do all of these, and he does all these, but depending on the technology, that is going to change. OK, so now, once you have these firms, it's very easy to find the economy. The economy and the firm are the two sides of the same coin. Uh, the marginal value of the agent's ability in the economy is basically what problems they can solve. And depending on how you organize the firm, you're going to have the wage distribution economy. And depending on how the economy works, you're going to have the firm distribution. The thing that links the two is the scale of operations, like I told you before. If I have a big operation, then with a little bit more ability, I'm going to get a much bigger reward. If I have a small operation, Steve Jobs was without any technology, had to talk to everybody all the time. He would have had a little atelier in the 19th century. He, there would be nine guys. He would have been the best artisan in town. And his reward would have been small. His firm would have been small. And inequality would have been small. If he gets to leverage through all of this communication technology, then he gets to do much, much more. So then what happens with the communication cost change? So with the communication cost change, I'm going to be able to change the hierarchy which had these three direct reports. I now have email, I have voicemail, I can uh, talk to people very easily, I can send them, they can send me problems, etc. very fast. I'm going to expand my team size, I'm going to be able to deal with more people. Also, what is going to happen is, I have a division, as you saw before, between what problems they solve and what problems the boss solves. If asking passing problems on to the boss, to the guy who is the expert, if that's cheaper, then we're going to pass more problems up, and these guys are going to solve less problems. OK? So that's the comparative statics. The communication cost goes down. Then getting the top guy to solve the problem is cheaper relative to getting the bottom guy. So the, ta the cent centralization increases. The thing gets more centralized. Let me give you an example to fix this idea, because it's important. This is some conference, a uh, peace conference between the British and the Chinese um, uh, 100 and uh, something years ago. Imagine there's no telegraph, no communication cost at all, no communication at all. So this would be Spanish Empire. You have the Viceroy, right? The only way he can get asked for help, ask for solutions, ask for instructions to the king of Spain is by sending a boat that takes three months. How much? 
empowerment of these guys do you have? How much decentralization do you have? Total. If he has to wait for instructions on some rebellion in some city until they send the, until the whole boat goes back and forth, then the whole thing has gone out of control. He has to decide. So with very expensive communication cost, everything needs to be solved down oh, the hierarchy. In this particular case, same thing happened with negotiations between countries 100 years ago. An ambassador was God, because the ambassador was the person, he couldn't go back to England to get instructions. There was telegraph, but you couldn't get really the detail of what's going on. So again, he's very empowered. With communication costs being expensive, you get a very decentralized structure. When communication costs get cheaper, then I don't need my ambassador to do anything. He just needs to go to the parties. I can call the other, my counterpart in the other country and get my answer. So communication, these communication costs, the communication cost revolution, these skills workers, because they can rely more and more on some central guy who has all the spreadsheets and can make all the decisions and everybody else is kind of just acting uh, very automatically. Uh, how does this account for the facts and what kind of things, can we understand anything that we didn't understand before? Do we have new predictions? Uh, and, and then we, we go to your, to your questions. So let's think of some of these questions that I put on the table before. Um, large increase in CEO pay and increase in firm size and concentration. That's straightforward erosion type, Lucas type, man type, superstar effect, okay? You have larger firms, the marginal value of a little bit more skill is much higher, the same way as with Ronaldo and the same way as with the opera singer. Uh, Gabe, Xavier Gabe and Augustin Landier had a paper where they actually showed that the increase in the size of firms traced exactly the increase in the compensation, okay? Um, it's sensible, there's no proof, but it's reasonable. Steve Kaplan has done a paper arguing that, trying to look for evidence that this is what's going on. Uh, there are some, some guys like, for example, Bob Chuck in, in Harvard, who basically say what is happening is the CEOs are stealing the money, right? They are just self-serving. They appoint their friends, the remuneration committees, and so on. The problem with the kind of stealing explanation is that it, it requires you to, to come to the, the view that corporate governance has deteriorated over the last 30 years. If you want to explain more stealing now than 30 years ago, the 30-year award where it was all smoke-filled room, there was no information coming out, it was an old men's, old boys club, all white males who had gone to the same private school and the same private university, etc., would have been more transparent and more careful with CEO pay than the current boards. Also, which are under huge inspection, which have all this transparency, which have people from all backgrounds, etc. Also, when you look at the CEO pay at private at firms that are privately owned, private equity controlled, you see the same facts as here, okay? It's not like Bill Gates pays his CEO less or uh, Amantia Ortega, the Inditex owner and boss, pays his CEO less than, than this. He's paying the same. So when, this, when, when the board doesn't exist, essentially, same thing happens. The story that superstar compensation for CEOs has to do with firm size I think is, is sensible, particularly when you see that the same is happening for superstar players, singers, etc. Now, concentration. And here's something very interesting. So nobody in this room knows this uh, because it's data from today <laughs> and from these last few days. It's from a paper by my co-author, Stefan Rossi Hansberg, uh, with his co-author, Sartre and Tractor. So they've done something very, very cool. Okay, so I'm saying, look, communication cost. So what's the story I've told you? Communication costs have gone down. The C size goes up. CEO does more. Uh, the skill of people down the line is going to be less important. If that's happening, how does that explain concentration? Well, let me tell you a stylist fact of concent about concentration, and we see if the theory seems sensible. A stylist fact about concentration that the world doesn't know and will know because it will be very discussed after Esteban writes for Luigi this account on your, on your blog, uh, is that the change in concentration in the U.S. has happened at the national level, but not at the zip code level. There is less competition nationally 
yes, Walmart and Target and so on, nationally they're accounting for a biggest share. But when you look zip code by zip code, there is more competition. Concentration is going down. How can this be? What sense does that make? Well, it makes a lot of sense. Walmart has a technology, communication technology that allows it to do more. It enters the little zip code where there was a mom and pop before. Before the mom and pop, let's put it extreme. The mom and pop had a monopoly. The little shop, local shop, had a local monopoly. Now Walmart goes in and they divide the market 50-50. From a national perspective, Walmart is increasing. Its share of sales is increasing. From a local perspective, we have more competition in Hyde Park now that we have Walmart and this, and this small shop. You see? So the idea is, as the, the increase in concentration we are seeing is happening through the entry of large firms that enter more and more national and international markets. This is not international, but it will be the same, I, I'm willing to, to bet. But it's not actually in any of those segments increasing concentration at the local level. This seems to me consistent with the idea that we are seeing an increase in firm size that is driven, that could be driven, okay, I don't have proof here, I'm telling you a story that accounts for the status facts, that's all. That would be explained by better, lower communication costs, making it possible for these firms to have a technology that allows them to go national more easily. The FAGA firms that use their, that have their tentacles in all of the economy, could that be even visible? Or the Inditex that has shops where in every minute of the day knows what shirts have been sold in every place on earth. Would have been even be feasible 20 years ago without the communication technology revolution? No. Now, interestingly, when you look at productivity, and I'm going to talk this in two days, so I'm just opening up, uh, leaving something interesting to talk about. We'll talk about productivity in a couple of days. Interestingly, productivity has slowed down brutally in the economy for all but a very select group of firms. This is from Andrews and Kiara Criscolo and a few OCDE uh, researchers. They show that productivity growth has been massive on the frontier firms, but that it has been very low for the firms that are not in the frontier. In a way, consistent with this communication drop change that allows all of these firms to um, have a technology that allows them to go national and global and all these other firms that don't benefit from those economies of scale. The other set of facts have to do with wages. How do we think this communication story, how does it tell us about wages? And I have a couple of papers with Stefan Rossi Hansberg where we actually go put these firms and these hierarchies in the economy and draw the whole wage distribution. And basically what it tells you is, look, there are two things that make the superstar clearly matters more. I think all of you can see that because he has a communication technology that allows him to control all these resources. What happens to the worker lower on the distribution and to the middle worker? Well, these guys matter less because they're going to be relying on the knowledge of the other person. They have less knowledge themselves. And they're going to be all sorted in the bigger firm. They're not going to be sorted in different firms like, oh, you're a little bit better, so you go to a little bit better firm. The big firm basically has all this undifferentiated labor. In a way, they all live in the shadow of the superstars. The communication technology allows the, 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 the superstar talent to kind of leverage their talent by having this big firm and cast the shadow on the workers who, well, you're a better worker, but anyway, you're not, your knowledge is not so, so, so important in this new economy where you're just doing basically the very, very simple problems and everything is going to be dealt with at the top. Uh, that's the graph from our paper. This is actually a simulation of, of the model, but it basically shows you that uh, this is the old wage distribution. We get now this communication cost drop. All of these guys benefit because the economy is more productive, but all of these guys in the middle who were kind of, yeah, they're doing okay, and they were kind of helpful and so on, now are actually in the shadow of these top guys who are really, really benefiting from the new technology. Uh, what about the drop in the labor share? Can we explain that? I don't have evidence for that, and one, some empirical people would, would need to do this. But I asked this to the authors of the 2017 paper that I showed you before, and they couldn't answer. Could the fact that labor compensation is going down 
be a consequence of the fact that you're paying the top people with shares and with equity. Meaning, yes, labor compensation is going down, but the compensation of uh, Breen and Page and the compensation of uh, the Zuckerbergs of the world is in stock. And yeah, it looks like there is a bigger increase in the capital share, but in fact, it could be returns to talent, at least partially. It could be a measurement error or something that we're not really measuring well in terms of the return to those entrepreneurs who are creating these massive, massive, massive firms. I mean, we're talking about trillions. Um, so I promised to be 45 and five minutes behind. So that's good. Um, there is a lot going on. I'm not going to say the China shock is not important and the elimination of the routine jobs is not important. All those things have happened. But the argument is that the large drop in communication costs leading to superstar managers, superstar firms, could account nicely for wage polarization, the increase in CO pay, the holding out in the middle, the increase in compensation, and potentially for the increase in the, in the, in the, in the shadow in the, in the share. The shadow of the superstars would operate in three ways. As superstars become more important, in a way, we are all matched with the same guy who solves all our problems. So we are not. In the past, the good workers would have been in the firm of Sloan or, or Steve Jobs. The bad workers would have been with a bad manager. So that would have amplified their difference. Now they're all in the firm of Steve Jobs. So that reduces the heterogeneity. Second, their skill matters less because at the end, a lot of problems are getting solved on the top by the communication, by, by the fact that communication costs, technology costs, uh, includes. And of course, as the superstar firms get bigger, there is a demand effect. The superstars are getting, uh, now people in Real Valladolid don't even have to the stadium because they can watch the Madrid game at home. So we also see a demand effect that also pushes the superstar uh, effect uh, even further. So um, that's all I wanted to say. I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. There is a, there is a microphone. So uh, uh, please, if you want to raise your hand, uh, we, we take few minutes. Um. I know you guys have a class, so I'll finish by one. Uh. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you if it, you could comment on some implication of uh, your theory on the I want to say on the farm side distribution, specifically two things. One is, it seems to me that your theory implies that if a small, a young firm is going to grow, it's going to grow faster because we have uh, lower cost. And so if I have to reach an optimal size, I'll go there right away because now I don't have all these hindrances. On the other hand, it looks like if you have a lot of superstar firms, it's going to be harder to be a small guy in the world of Amazon and Google. And I was wondering if you could comment a bit on that and maybe on the data. I think that. Uh, there is always this, this question when you look at, in, the, in the data between small and new. Okay? A new firm of a very talented guy, he can leverage his talent and, and go fast up. A small firm that is old, you know, that's the one that's going to suffer. So I think when we have policy discussions and people in the policy are always like, oh, let's, let's help small firms because all the growth is in small firms. No. The growth is not in the small firm. The growth is in young firms that potentially grow fast. And so indeed, I would say, if you look at H as the other side of this coin, H and small, then you can reconcile. I think small firms will suffer in the shadow of Amazon. Young firms might actually use this technology to just really scale up fast. Hi. Um, so early in the presentation, you had the charts on concentration of CR4, CR20. Um, I was just curious, do they look at whether that's due to M&A or just lack of new entrants versus uh, someone having a competitive advantage taking market share? And does that even matter? Yes. I mean, I, my, my sense is that um, there has been a lot of discussion. There's a lot of people who talk about market power and mergers, and Luigi has run a conference on that. You maybe have an opinion that you want to share. Um, the, the story that I told you of Rossi Hansberg now suggests that at least a big part of the story is an efficiency, sto if an efficiency, not an efficiency, an efficiency story, meaning, um, I think I just jumped it, sorry. Uh, when I had the stylized facts, I showed you, um, when I said back to stylized facts, here. 
um, the fact that it's these firms expanding, uh, growing market share, but uh, the local markets are actually uh, seeing uh, reductions, meaning more competition, to me suggests that it is actually more of an efficiency story than a monopolization uh, uh, than a monopolization story. That would be my my reading of it. But uh, there is, I mean, this is not going to be settled anytime very soon. I mean, this is going to be a big policy discussion of the next uh, few years. There's been, as you know, the antitrust authorities have been very passive with respect to these big internet firms. Facebook has been allowed, been allowed to buy Instagram and WhatsApp, which now looking at it seems like, how, what were they thinking? Uh, now it's clear that this is not going to happen any longer, I think, or well, we'll see what, I mean, I think at least some antitrust authorities are concerned. But this would suggest that that's not the biggest part of the story. That the biggest part of the story are efficiencies in production and in communication technology to allow bigger firms to become even bigger and to control or to, to sell in larger markets. Michael Porter has a paper uh, on, uh, so he ran a survey on uh, how managers spend their time. And he's essentially showing that they spend most of their time answering emails. So could you please elaborate a little bit more on this communication channel? Yeah, perfect, thank you. I mean, I, I, I don't know, Andrea Pratt has a paper on this that I always quarrel with him about. I, 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 it says the same thing. So he reads this as, oh, you spend too much time with, with, with consultants and you spend too much time answering emails, and that's bad. The managers are losing time. I don't think so, actually. I think that that is the technology. What do I mean by problem solving? I mean, you get an email or somebody telling you, we have a breakdown in production, the line of so and so, and then you send five emails to five people. Hey, go there, you fly there, you do this. And those five people are going to send another 20 emails, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is the job of the managers. I mean, I think a lot of people in economics and, and everywhere are very confused about what the manager does. And they think managers are supposed to be kind of supervising or monitoring people. I think that's completely wrong. In equilibrium, people don't need monitoring. I mean, if you were a lazy bum who's not doing your work, you wouldn't be employed. The second day, the third day, the fourth day, you would be found out. It's a relational contract. You're there for months or for years. People find you out pretty, pretty fast. The managers need to be there seeing if you're working. And I think that largely the manager is actually using his knowledge to deal with problems. And in that sense, email is the way that now happens. Before, he would have to go around, and that's why his technology to answer problems is much better than it used to be. We take maybe one more. Hi. There are some firms out there that are trying to become flatter. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how that trend might play into your theory and if you see that having an impact on some of the distributions you talked about. I mean, I think that the fact that you can easily ask questions could, I mean, you don't need to be filtering. I mean, imagine like I have a very limited ability because I don't have emails. So everybody has to come to my office. I don't want everybody to come to my office. So I get like a team of RAs that like the RAs have to, TAs have to pick up all the questions, right? Now I have a technology that allows me to like batch answer questions like brr, brr, brr. then I just get rid of the RAs or TAs and I answer the question myself, right? So the fact that the communication technology is going up, is, going, is, is improving sharply, could allow me to increase my span without actually adding layers. Thank you guys, it's a pleasure, enjoy your class and if you want, I'll be here tomorrow. Thank you.